imaginary banner. In fact, this is not going to be a banner, it's going to be a slam. Those who don't know what a slam is, please raise your hands. <laughs> okay, I will try, I will read for, for you the definition in Wikipedia. <laughs> a poetry slam is a competition of which poets read or write, recite original work. These performances are judged on a numeric scale of one to six by the audience. You are the judge. And, you know, poetry is related to beauty, and math is also related to beauty and poetry. Maybe you realize if you were at the previous presentations or if you have been close to math. And so this is a film slam, which is in one, one in which all performances must perform to a specific uh, theme. And here the theme is a vision. Uh, it's a vision of mass communication to the general public and you will be the judges with your applause <laughs> and they will be visionary, okay? So, uh, so let me show you how just three very short uh, slides. So I am from Argentina and we were using part of this and thus you will know more about imaginary ones in a second from now. And we were using this uh, fantastic um, software that are very user-friendly for, uh, we made an experience with high school students and they produced these pictures that you see there after just one hour workshop for the first time, maybe this one, or let me see, or this one. This was, these were produced by 15 year teenagers after one hour of work. So it's fantastic to work and to engage young people. So I'm very happy now to invite you to listen to the, our first speaker, which is uh, Gerd Martin Goyen. Uh, he got a PhD in math in Göttingen, and I cannot pronounce well, German so good, in uh, his task and existence. In uh, 1973, he has many as a big leader in math. But I would like to isolate that he has been the director of the Mathematical Institute in Oberwarfa from 2002 until 2013. And during his term, the imaginary was created. He's the heart of it. And I leave you with that man. Thank you very much. Uh, now I go. OK. Here you see the first slide. So the idea of imaginary, as uh, you see, is not here is really to get interest, that people interest who are not close to mathematics, to mathematics, and actually to wide audience uh, more, in a most attractive and most uh, interactive manner. So the interactivity and attractivity is one of the features. Uh, and the aim is to improve the image of mathematics, uh, just from the bad image we have seen in the previous image about mathematicians, and uh, then uh, to find let uh, people getting interested and from the actually from the adult to the very young one and here you see a picture that seems to prove it i mean uh, they, they like to play around and the old ones also like to play by the way but uh, maybe sometimes get interested now this is the research institute in the Bavarma. the the project imaginary is a project of uh, Oberwolfa, is still run by Oberwolfa, maintained by Oberwolfa, so it, it should live for long term. The next is kind of dissemination page where imagery has been uh, active in many, many countries. And uh, you see here, I think uh, there were more than uh, 29 countries and 120 cities, and uh, with more, many, many, several, I mean, more than 1 million visitors. In, in fact, the idea is not that we go there, but the point is that uh, other institutions take up the initiative from a website and produce their own exhibition. So it, interac it worked interactively, and here you see one of the prominent persons who just opened the library and juicy RT with imaginary pictures explaining it, and uh, the idea is actually to, to use the material which we provide and uh, uh, develop their own maybe additional things. And another wonderful example is um, the uh, cooperation with NIMS Imaginary here during the ICN, 
but probably it's going co to continue also after the ICN. And here you see Hong um, Yong Park and David Eisenbach. They are discussing serious algebraic geometry with a surfer. Uh, maybe they just play, I didn't check. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's one of the things. And uh, now um, I just, uh, again, I like to mention these people here. And uh, you know Cedric Milani and Hong Yong Park, but the other two will be presented by Alicia Dickenstein, who is the moderator of this uh, session. And after the mission plan, those who want to have a, uh, a tour, we have a guided tour to the uh, exhibition downstairs, just follow the guides. I think that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Looking forward to meet and to listen to him. He's Cedric uh, Milani. He got his PhD in uh, France, University of Paris, in, uh, in uh, 1998. And he got many prestigious awards. I will just mention that he got the Field Medal in uh, 2010 in Hyderabad. And he's a professor at Lyon and he's the director of the Institut Henri Pancarin in Paris. And he's been very much engaged with math outreach in many different ways, and it's a pleasure to introduce him to you. Thank you very much. It's my uh, pleasure to be in this panel. I already said how much I appreciate it that the SEM takes care here in seeing so much of these uh, global uh, issues about not just doing mathematics, but also communicating about mathematics, and I think it's so important. I've been involved in various activities uh, at institutional level, at personal level, over the past years, I already had the privilege to discuss with Gert Martin Royal about possible future cooperation in Institute Poincaré, and we, uh, I've been working for years already in the, on the project of the uh, Math Museum near the Institute Poincaré in Paris. It's a long project, but you have to find funding, whatever, vision, lots of things. But I will, in this slab, as I explained, uh, only uh, talk about my personal experience of uh, communication as a mathematician, not about my institutional experience. Let me first say that my first encounter with a, a journalist from the outside world, so to speak, not a scientific journalist, was something like 10 years ago. Oh, okay, he was working for Science Journal, made an interview on me and so on. It was a disaster. It was so bad. After the interview, the guy went back to his uh, boss and said, I met a crazy guy, did not understand any word. The guy had not dared to tell me that he did not understand anything. So I kept on saying and so on. It was a complete disaster. And we had to arrange things and so on. This was first encounter. This is to say that mathematical communication is not something that you are born with, it's not something that is natural, it's something that you train. Second encounter was, well, in fact, a training operation. So in 2007, in a training session organized by CNRS, and I was there for uh, two days, this was in Lyon. The guy just before here, Etienne Gis, who was my neighbor in Lyon, had recommended personally to me that I attend this training session. And it is good, I think if the uh, CNRS authorities have told me go and follow this uh, training session, I would have said, this guy is crazy, you don't know what's important, whatever. But it was my colleague telling me, go and see, you will see how interesting it is. And so I believed him. Four of us in the laboratory followed this training and we were all, all delighted with this experience. That's my first advice if you want to do serious math communication, get some training with an inspiring guy. It will really change. And this guy, this journalist, this, uh, this was a media person, expert in communication and so on. And in particular, he explained us a bit of the psychology and constraints on the journalist and how you have to put him with you, on your side, what are his difficulties, his expectations, what he's afraid of, what is the margin, etc. It's really interesting. And uh, years later, when I was invited by a school of scientists, journalists, to give a lecture, I did the reverse exercise. Try to put yourself in the brain of a mathematician and explain them how much we have the difficulties when we face a journalist and how the contact can be difficult. It's important to be aware of this. Last night, I spent again, like one hour, maybe it was uh, after midnight or something, repairing the interview of, uh, which I had given for a science journalist back in France. 
When the interview arrived, she submitted the result for me to check, and so it was a disaster. Not much to change, but disaster. And then I worked to change the stuff, and now it's okay. And she told me this morning, oh, beautiful, it's much better now, it's super, and so on. If you can make the journalist your ally, then it will be, it will be good. And uh, this is changing everything. Next, it's complicated, I say, communicating with nothing, with the journalists, communicating with the media, communicating with the uh, public audience. Why do it? You know, we already have enough trouble communicating with each other and explaining <laughs> mathematical research, then why bother going to communicate to general non-mathematicians? There are various motivations for this. It's good to have all of them in, uh, in, in mind. First, uh, which we are very sensitive to, is make sure that young generations are interested in this and know that these are good jobs, inspiring jobs. Maybe these are not the jobs in which you make the most money, but these are jobs in which you make good, if you feel good and recall, by the way, that uh, 2009 uh, mathematician was ranked by Wall Street Journal as the number <coughs> one job in the world in terms of how rewarding this is. This is the goal we think of most naturally, but that's not the only one. Another goal is that we feel good about the way people look at us. Not people thinking these are crazy nerds doing their stuff on their side and we don't know what these mathematicians are doing. People say that it's good to give them money, but who knows what the hell they do with this money and so on. It's important that people have a good opinion of us as a, as a profession and so on. And just to be heard, nowadays, it may be sad, but if you don't recall people that you exist as a job, as a community, people completely forget. One day you lose your funding, one day people will uh, say, I don't think this is a good job and so on. At least you don't want this to happen. Another important goal is to maintain the link and cohesion, coherence of uh, society. All pieces of society are important, this we know, and we have to recall how much we are important to other people at the same time as we need uh, people. We, we need engineers, we need finance people, we need uh, artist people, we need everybody to make the world run, and we are part of this. And it is known, by the way, that the uh, part of mathematics and mathematical research in the GDP is much higher than when we guess and is increasing year after year. And the uh, uh, final thing is sometimes many people, like people who take decisions, who run things, they are very much in demand of our advice in many things. Not really about explaining mathematics, but I get plenty over the past years, plenty of invitations, for instance, for clubs of uh, people doing CEO type job or uh, these people in administration, etc. are looking for general guidance. How to approach complex problems? How do you do it in your research work? And very often they say, it reminds me of some problem, this is very inspirational, and so on. Whole world is for people with difficult decisions to take. They don't know in hell who to ask advice for. We, as researchers, always uh, have uh, decisions to take which are complicated, subject to search, and they are in demand of our advice on this. What does the general audience want? This is a mixture of many things. Some of them want just curiosity. These scientists, what do they do? Some of them are thinking, will really this be a good job for my kids? Some of them think, many of them think, I'm not so bad in math. I'm angry by this. Maybe I have a chance to at least understand that last. Prove myself that I was not so dumb. Understand at last. Many people at the end of talks they come and say, Oh, if only I had a teacher like you, I would not have been so bad in that. I really think if they had a teacher like me, it would have changed nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good that they have this feeling, you know, to feel that the gift was not on their side, not that they were intrinsically dumb, and so on. And also, some people, they just uh, need to inquire about the world. They heard that mathematics is doing so and so, so much things. It's there in finance, it's there in the economy, it's there in space exploration, whatever. What do they do, these mathematicians? It's curiosity. And even these people who are very bad at math, they have the right to understand what we're doing. In the same way as people who are bad at writing, for instance, have the right to uh, follow and see what's going on in literature, what are the trends, read some novels, get, get informed about the trend in culture. Mathematics is technology, science, but is also part of culture. And this Many people are interested in this. Now, with that in mind, you see there are very different audiences you need to reach. And you have to make sure if you communicate, part of what you say will be interested for this or that audience. 
The best is when you can mix a little bit of everything in your talks. You cannot always do it, but sometimes. I've tried a number of different forms of communication. Some of them are good for this, some of them are good for that. I've tried, I've been, okay, of course, I've received a lot of exposition uh, after the ACM of 2010 and was invited in many places, and I did follow this job and see this and that, and not accept everything, many things, and then when things work, you get reinvited and so on. At present, I have a list of maybe 150 invitations that I could not uh, accept at public lectures and things like this. The more it works, the more they ask you, and you have to think each time. What did work? What did not work? What lesson should I uh, draw for the next stage? I did the radio. Radio is good because you can say things, people listen to you. I did television. Television is good because people see the attitude that you have when you interact with people. But don't expect that they listen to you. They're not interested <laughs> in what you are saying when you're on TV. But it's very efficient to reach. You agree? Yeah. It's very efficient to reach people that go on the street. I saw you on TV, it's so cool, mathematician, it's such a good job. They cannot say one word of what you said, but they were they like it and so on. This also is important. I was in some movies, one of them was a broadcast yesterday. I prepared some uh, uh, articles for some newspapers. Or, I also did some exercises in which they asked me for some text which is a mixture of something like poetry or literature and something like mathematics. Some, some people really, really like this. I did a lot of public lectures, lectures in high school, lectures in the, for little kids, 10 years old, lectures for older kids, lectures for politicians, lectures for uh, workers, every, uh, all kinds of possible things, I, I think. Uh, I, I never went I never went on Facebook or Twitter just I have no time and it's a special thing you know also it's a skill you have to learn I never invested in that out of uh, a lack of time. There are many obstacles and it happened more than once that after something that went wrong I, I thought I should stop or at some point after a, a, an article writing and so on which had gone completely wrong because of some wrong copy edition and this is many angry comments. My wife told me you should stop this newspaper. And I, I looked so desperate, you see, and I said, no, okay, we'll do it again. And it worked. Next time it worked. And one of the next ones I did in the same series was a big, a big success. And, uh, oh, yes, I have to conclude. Yes. <laughs> this is always, always a, a, a my problem. <laughs> to singer out just one experience, which was the most uh, life changing in all this. Clearly, very clearly, this was the, the book, uh, which is available for cheap price, you know, for the editions. But uh, uh, seriously speaking, this book first came by accident because I met some editor. He understood I wanted to do mass communication, but he was not interested whatsoever in me doing communication about mathematical concepts or what I work on, what is entropy, whatever. What he wanted was to know how. I work in my daily life, what I do, what I think, what is my life, and so on. Just the social aspects. And I was very embarrassed that he told me what to do. And in the end, I, uh, I decided I would go for a concept in which I would describe one theorem, but not the meaning, not what it's good for, just how I made it, how we made it, because it was a work with my uh, uh, collaborator, Clément Mou. It was a long work, and as in all long works, it was full of unexpected things, high and down. Uh, it was two years and a half, various countries, points where you are desperate, points where it works, points where you are mistaken, points in which you announce false things, points in which you have a discussion that changes everything. You see how much it depends on chance, how much it depends on who you encounter, how much it depends on where you are, what you do, what music you are listening, how you sleep, whatever, many things that people have no idea. And uh, I put it as kind of patchwork, I tell you. And this, uh, I put also the mathematical equations, the mathematical world, no explanation whatsoever. This was contrary to any rule of communication, but just give the impression what it is, the, like to be the brain of a mathematician. And, uh, and uh, I tell you, those days it is out, when I this, ah, oh, what do people say? Uh, what will the colleagues say? They would say, um, I was crazy, this is also, uh, etc. It was, it worked beautifully. First, to go to simple facts first, I made more money in France with that book than my professor's salary. Uh, the year it was, the year it was out. 
But it was just one aspect in which the French professors are reading. You know. It's now it's nothing to do with the, with the American professors. But then, these comments to receive, hundreds of emails. Your book is so great, I never was interested in mathematics, but now with your book, oh, this is the first time in 50 years that I think it's so interesting. Or uh, uh, comments like, your book changed my life. I had this, verbatim, a writing as a, as a comment. And hundreds of them, you receive this, nothing can make you feel uh, prouder than this. And your colleagues can say anything, your friends can say anything, whatever, even if the say are not good, you feel so, so happy. Now, it's general, it's a thing we have to learn. There are many people out in the world who are looking for us mathematicians as inspirational models. No of us doing mathematics. There are some other people somewhere who will be happy to listen to what we do and our fears and anxieties and how we overcome them and so on. They will be happy to hear, we'll be happy to see they will. It's a shame the operation. That's the most important thing. That's so we so uh, <laughs> and he is also a teacher of year of knowledge. He has been teaching so far in Costa Rica, England, Tanzania, Austria, Togo and Switzerland as of today. And where he's the head of the department in the International School of Lausanne. And he's part of the national team. So it is this. Thank you Alicia. Perhaps I should also mention that I come from Belgium. I grew up in Belgium, but I'm half French, half German. So if you're wondering why my, where my accent comes from, Atlantis is uh, as good as I guess as any. <laughs> um, I like to believe in multiverse theory. The reason is that in a multiverse, maybe I continued with pure mathematics after school. This is our reality, however, and this one, this is what happened. I did the same mathematics as you did in school, but uh, then our paths diverged. You guys kept going with the equations, and I hear ICM with beautiful proofs and theorems, and I, mm, I went traveling, and I started teaching mathematics, uh, and finances, finances along the way, and mathematics was pretty much the only subject I might conceivably teach. Uh, and I should also mention, um, I got a degree in engineering in full math, but I can't say that too loud, otherwise someone would say, what, an engineer was set into the ICM, someone called security. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm here to talk to you about something that reunites us, though, with a very real universe, it's mathematics communication. I see mathematics communication as a network of bridges spanning the divide between mathematics research and the wider population, um, which includes those are people who we hope will one day continue what we are doing. Um, and I just want to say, don't get me wrong, I have learned to love mathematics. I, uh, as a math teacher, I do math every day. I learn maths, I teach maths. I don't even have, even have to publish anything. And I get to work with fabulous people like my students, uh, Lars and Philip here. And, um, uh, well, uh, I'd like to uh, I've mentioned that these bridges between math and mathematics research and the wider population, and I'd like to give you my take on one of these bridges, the imaginary project. Imaginary is something that can reunite you with her. Stephanie, who was one of my students, she's an amazing athlete, but she'll take on a mathematical challenge too. My first contact with imaginary was when I followed the link um, to the website, and I just want to talk you through what kind of happened in my head when I first looked at it. I said, wow, this is a really good picture of the Lorenzo chapter. Um, and then I started reading some of the stuff, imaginary open mathematics. Hmm, I wonder what that means. And I also looked at a picture like this and said, oh, this is interesting. This looks like a 3D version of what we're doing with functions. I've always thought it's a good idea to choose area by volume and surface area. After all, we live in a three-dimensional world. And perhaps something similar can be said about functions too. Anyway, such thinking got me going with imaginary. 
Uh, I just thought the importance of the aesthetic appeal was something I'm very sensitive to. And I dreamt of doing an exhibit in my school. After all, the arts department does exhibits all the time. Why not the mathematics department? No, wait. Why not the mathematics department together with the arts department? Um, I start to understand what open mathematics might mean. Open mathematics is all about exchanges. One day I heard a TED talk in Paris by a mathematician on the ingredients of good ideas. What ingredients make for good ideas? And one of these ingredients was exchanges. And you know who was talking? With a certain Sidney Lamy. <laughs> And um, I want to say, well, open mathematics is all about exchanges. Our, uh, the very idea of imaginary is that people can exchange and participate. Our slogan, open mathematics, says that imaginary wants to be an ingredient in that be any good ideas for you. Open means something like open house. You're free to come and go, there are no locked doors. Um, you can bring something or take something out, out. I know a family with five adolescent children, and their parents are very much open house. So they're, they're, these children, they bring their friends home all the time. I can tell you that house is a house that is alive. And here's the core of my message. An open house makes for a house that is alive. Open mathematics lives through participation. You upload your material or download someone else's. The point is not that someone uses your stuff, it is what that person will do with it. Given some quality control, people will start to use materials in ways that we couldn't imagine. Other mathematicians will use it. Museums will use it. You can see here an installation at the MoMA in New York based on some imaginary material. This is uh, my fabulous calculus class, I'm part of it. I like every lesson with them. Schools might use it, therefore. Artists might use it. The other day, Francesco uh, taught me, the, art, the artist took, taught me through this painting, or uh, this picture, at, which is at the imaginary exhibit downstairs. I was really touched by all the things that, that were in there, really. Even chefs will use your material. <laughs> this is here the cook who was inspired by this in the mathematics exhibit and say. My point is it is incredible what people will do. They even translate text into Korean for you. I have a student, he's here, that's Giorgio. Uh, he's working on a research project right now this summer based on some material that we found on the imaginary platform. Uh, at least, I hope he's working on it. Hey, George, are you working on your project? <laughs> he's at the beach in, in Italy, so I cross my fingers. <laughs> the message is this. At imaginary, we've witnessed the creative transformation into content, into ways that no one could anticipate. In my hometown, there's uh, uh, periodically a free market that means people can come and bring stuff that they no longer need, and other people can come along and take things for free. Even people bring people bring even food to it that you can have for free and enjoy. You cannot pay anything. At Imaginary, uh, we're often asked, where can we buy the exhibit? Now you know the answer. There's nothing to buy at the, uh, Imaginary. It's based on participation. Let me tell you a little bit more about my job. Um, you, as you know, mathematics uh, is facing some tough challenges with developments in modern mathematics. First of all, there's a splintering of mathematics into a kind of specialized nooks and corners. This makes the transfer of new mathematics more difficult into school curricula. Then there's technology, which actually questions whether we can teach mathematics for much longer, the way it's still mostly happening today. And as you know, also our subject is under a lot of pressure and scrutiny um, from all kinds of directions. Uh, from PISA evaluation studies and uh, back to basic profits, etc. I've even heard someone say to me, mathematics could one day disappear like the classics did. In Europe that means studying Latin and Greek. I say, I wish I could have taken that person, by the way, uh, to Bridges on Monday. We're 
Villani was talking about the, the movie industry and how it's the, the biggest, the largest consumer of mathematics these days. I say this. We might well see too few students choosing to continue their study in mathematics if school mathematics doesn't somehow stay connected to mathematics research. And we need you, the mathematicians, to help schools adapt to this. My students need you, like Dan and Noah here. In order to keep mathematics irrigated with young talent, we definitely need the cooperation of everyone involved in mathematics research, mathematics communication, and mathematics education. You might think, why should my math be open? Why, why should I make my stuff available to everyone else? Well, my students, my colleagues and myself at school, teachers worldwide are the reason why you should consider sharing as much as possible to the outside world. With the class of Dan and Noah, we did a unit on uh, algebraic surfaces, actually. Uh, something I wouldn't have dreamt of doing had not a mathematician gone through the trouble of producing a high-quality, user-friendly software that we could experiment with. It was an interesting pro program, and uh, this is Powell's result here, snowman on a snowboard, you know, in a single equation. Okay. Uh, and um, if, if you want to talk to me uh, for details later on, uh, ask me. Uh, but my point is, I can guarantee you this. If you produce some high quality material, make it available for free, for example, on the imaginary platform, then there is a teacher somewhere in the world who is going to use it, and probably a lot more because we're talking to each other. You know, my school, there's a, a large magazine stand in front of the library. I uh, think the mathematics teachers, they have several, the science teachers, sorry, they have several magazines they can choose from, like New Scientist, Nature, etc. In, uh, there is no magazine that tells me today uh, what's going on in mathematics because no one is writing one for our sort of audience. I'm almost finished, yeah. <laughs> in, fact, they, in fact, the teacher told me jokingly, you can always read the page numbers in the other magazine. I find initiatives like Imaginary useful in keeping me in touch with what's happening today. And as you can see, I don't think I'm the only one. So this is about visions for mathematics communication. Here's my vision. In the future, there will be more sharing between mathematicians, more open mathematics, and an increased focus by mathematicians to communicate their work. In the future, mathematics communication will look less like this, and more like that. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is the author of this fantastic organization map book translated to Korea. <laughs> um, magic tricks, she will explain. And then it's Kappa Severbao. I don't know how well pronounced. She got her PhD in 2011 in Berlin, in Germany, and then was a postdoc at Duke and now is at Tübingen, but she also works for the Mathematics Institute of Wolper, and she's part of the imaginary team. And uh, she was also a math ambassador of the German Mathematical Society in 2009. Thank you, Alicia. So I'll be talking to you not about the book, but about the snapshots of modern mathematics that we started at Oberwolper. So you're probably wondering what is a snapshot. Here are copies of some, and I brought paper copies that you can get at the exit when you leave. Um, so snapshots are texts written by mathematicians for the general public. For example, for people like David, you just heard speak, they can then use it in their classroom or for themselves, or also for other mathematicians who might be interested in your work on a more generally accessible level. So let me reiterate, so a snapshot is a short text written by a mathematician or group of mathematicians, edited by math communicators, possibly illustrated by a designer, and distributed for free via imaginary on the heading texts that you can see there. Kind of. Whom is it for? It's for the general public, it's for high school and college teachers, it's for science journalists who want to get to know what you do in your research, it's for high school and college students, etc. And 
It's a project by the Mathematical Research Institute in Overbalt. You've seen the picture in your Martin's talk already. And this is the enlargement of the last page of every snapshot, so I should give very quick credit to the Class Geora Foundation, who's supporting both the snapshot and the Imaginary project, and also to the Overbalt Foundation. We, on each, uh, each snapshot is, is edited by a junior editor, and I'm a senior editor, so I overlook the editing. So the junior editors at the moment are Sophia Janssen and Leah Brenner, both the PhD students in mathematics, and we get support by all these other people listed in blue on the left-hand side or on the imaginary team. <coughs> So what's the procedure that we do with the snapshots at Oberwolfa? So first of all, at Oberwolfa, every week there's a workshop, and the workshop has an organizer or a team of organizers, and we tell them about the snapshot program and what it's for, and then we ask them to select volunteers. And these volunteers then, as authors, write the snapshot. And we give them guidelines to do this. They're online. You can download them on the Oberwolfa website. And we give them a latex class and a latex template. And then they write the snapshot, submit it via imaginary, declare what mathematical subject it's about, and connections to other fields like engineering and finance it might have, and they share it under Creative Commons license for free. We then edit the snapshot and make editing suggestions to the authors, the organizers of the workshop approve the workshop, the snapshot, and then the editor publishes the snapshot, and you can find them online. So what are we doing when we're editing them? We're doing the obvious things like checking grammar and language, but we also help them with lessons and credits. But we're also doing what maybe Cedric has learned in his science communication class, namely, we suggest analogies, we name relevant accessible literature, we're trying to bridge the gaps to the high school curriculum, we're trying to make illustrations, formulating questions for the reader, just in general, enhancing the text so that it will be more understandable for a person who didn't get as much mathematical training or research training in mathematics as we have as mathematicians. Okay, and it's, it's very important for us that our editors are all trained mathematicians, but we've also read a lot of literature on how to write a good and understandable text that was written by journalists. What are our goals? Our goals is to show that mathematics can be understood, that it's diverse, that it has surprising practical applications, because there are also workshops on applications of mathematics at Oberhofer, that mathematics is fun, elegant, and creative, and you name it. Our goal is also to encourage the reader to be curious about mathematics and to show that mathematicians are individual people that are diverse in personality, gender, ethnicity, and all this, that they have different motivations for doing mathematics, that they're approachable, etc. So we share a lot of the goals with the project that the and Jesus described earlier today. So this is the vision snap, so let me give you some visions we have for these snapshots. So this is the first vision slide. So we have the dream that at some day we'll have a machine like the one shown to you on the left hand side, which is the chocolate vending machine, but that sells snapshots instead. <laughs> or 3D prints of imaginary objects. Maybe stations as an art project, maybe in a museum at, in a museum store, maybe at institutes like Oberhofa. We have the dream that maybe someone who educates teachers uses the snapshots to educate teachers on current <coughs> mathematical research, and that we did part of the work for them to make it easier to communicate it. We have the dream that, or the vision that museums like the Korean Museum of Science here that the British exhibition has been at will maybe put snapshots on their program and allow you to print snapshots in their math exhibition, get them from us on a regular schedule, or email them to their friends out of the museum. That journalists use them to write interesting news stories about mathematics and teachers use them in the classroom. Our second set of visions is that people participate that maybe teachers, maybe mathematicians, maybe students, maybe someone entirely different creates additional materials that you can add on to the snapshots, like lessons you can teach in the classroom, like a cool illustration, that volunteers translate our texts, our snapshots into different languages, and we have a little budget to translate into German so that our own community can read them. The high school kids who maybe aren't so happy about their knowledge of English yet. 
And the third set of visions is that other institutes might pick up on the idea, and I'm here to support the logos of a few, and maybe participate, and then we have snapshots of modern mathematics from the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, and their scientists or their visitors. So, um, because we dealt a lot with licensing in this project, I'm very careful to put all the licenses, for all the, all the credits for all the images I stole from the internet. And here's my contact information in case you would like to also install a snapshot project at your institution, or if you would help to like translating the snapshots into your language, or if you would like to add didactical material to the snapshot project. Thank you very much. is Hyunju Park. He is the chair of this ICM, of the organization of this ICM, so we are very grateful for being so happy here. He got his PhD in 1995 from UC Berkeley, and he's a professor at Pohang University of Science and Technology in Korea, and he's the director of the Center for Application of Mathematics Principles in the NIMS Institute, National Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Korea. And he's the host of the NIMS Imaginary Exhibition here at ICM. Thank you. So this is it. Um, since we are running a little behind, uh, well, behind schedule, uh, I think I'll just uh, make it very short. Um, and I'm not sure if we'll have actually some Q&A session. Uh, there's another panel scheduled there for you. So uh, this is uh, a little different from actually what other people said. Uh, for example, I, I think uh, Cedric, uh, Cedric uh, talked about his book project which emphasized more personal and social side. Uh, instead of uh, conveying mathematical concepts, he talked about how he does that. So that's actually, uh, that puts some human touch, I think, right? Uh, how we do math, because of okay. <laughs> Four right. mathematicians do kind of right. process. Okay. Very good. And then uh, I think, uh, and then the other two uh, talks, they, uh, David and, uh, talked about an imaginary project which emphasizes the instead of interactivity. I mean, the, the students can actually uh, can interact instead of just listening. So, uh, which is actually available downstairs. So that's uh, another thing. But mainly these are within math and more mathematicians talking to the public. So we are talking about math, you know, math communications at the moment. But I, I like to actually uh, talk a little bit now about an, another kind of a trial, call it a test or trial an initiative. That's kind of an experiment. It's an experimental project about uh, presenting mathematics together with other branches of science and, and looking at the interaction of science, math and other branches of science. So this is kind of an experiment in, in that regard. So this we call it Chaos, uh, which is a, uh, which you saw, um, so which Chaos, which is a knowledge awake on stage. As the name says, it means we are conveying, we are a knowledge on the stage. It's like, uh, it's like audience should be able to, uh, you know, watch this as, a, as some kind of movie or a theatrical uh, scene. I mean, so that way, this, you know, this pressure, uh, and, and, and actually more, uh, feel more comfortable. And we, we, we like to use uh, some theatrical or, or uh, effect, uh, stage effect. So general vision, uh, so we, we like to, uh, um, we like to see this as uh, something about contemporary civilization and how mathematics, what kind of role math play there. In, 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 and we like to actually invite uh, many people in uh, natural science, social science, we also invite writers, critics, musicians, and artists, and we actually uh, uh, somehow explore mathematical aspects of their work. So that's uh, kind of new uh, vision. So uh, this uh, series is hosted by two people, uh, Minion Kim at Oxford and Hong Ji Park. That's me. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we. Uh, it's, 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 so this is the first one. So we, we actually tried experiment. Uh, we experimented. Yeah? The first one was given uh, 2002, in 2002, that's Kaus 1. It was about mathematics of matchmaking. 
actually uh, matchmaking, of course, has a long history. Even in the, you know, even in ancient times, I mean, uh, tribes leaders had to worry about their uh, the, the village kids uh, marriage and matchmaking and, and and make sure that they are happy, right? <laughs> Um, so this actually is a this is actually about really long pro uh, or, uh, and century, more than century, millennium but old problems. And this is actually this was about uh, Nobel Prize winning work, uh, uh, Lloyd Shapley and, and Alvin Roth. This work actually uh, got uh, the Nobel Economics Nobel Prize in Economics. So um, so uh, we actually used uh, some uh, uh, what is it uh, stage effect and. and and many uh, uh, animations and those things together to actually show the uh, concept and to actually uh, simulate certain situations and, and how what we want. I mean, I have five kid, five boys and five girls, and you know they choose, uh, they have their preferences, and, and then we do some matchmaking, and then it turns out that one boy got his uh, third uh, preference, preferred girl, and the, that particular girl got his uh, her uh, second for a boy. Now, the boys will be looking at the other two girls that he preferred, <laughs> like that sort of thing. And, and how should we actually make sure that, you know, eventually they will compromise with uh, their, their results. <laughs> meaning meaning uh, there is no divorce, there is no, I mean, there is no social cost. So, how, so this is about economics, this is about economics. You know, we, we want to minimize the social cost. So anyway, it worked, I think so. William Kim did a brilliant job, and even the, uh, there was there were even some elementary school students, and they actually understood the concept. They actually really loved it. So I, mean, I think it worked very good. Um, after that, we went to we get we get we became a little bit more brave. This time, we invited a physicist, a graphene physicist, uh, Philip Kim at Columbia University. Um, so he talked about uh, graphene and matters and, and solid state physics, condensed matter physics. And, and then we, we kind of quiz them and we try to, you know, uh, uh, get uh, some mathematics out of it. And, 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 and there were some, uh, there were some uh, discussion sessions afterwards, things worked. Um, and I think, uh, again, uh, and again, we have, as you see, it's like stage, we are using stage effect. It's like people are watching a movie you know, kind of thing. So, so that way, even though there is some serious math and physics going on, they would think they are watching a, you know, some kind of movie, right? And that's the whole thing. I mean, we want to uh, convey uh, some knowledge, some new knowledge to audience. And not, if it, instead of just talking about math, we talk about its uh, interactions with other branches of science in some theoretical settings. And, and that's, that kind of makes, that at least people feel like they, are, they understood something. They may realize it was an illusion later, but, but still that feeling uh, that they are maybe able to understand some, some you know, very up-to-date knowledge gives them this confidence that they can maybe, uh, maybe study it someday. Especially this is a very good feeling to young people. Um, our third was, we got even, even more brave. This time we, we invited Lin Su Chin, who is a world famous, very well-known composer. Contemporary music, uh, opera composer, based in Berlin. She lives in Berlin, in Germany, and, and, and she, her uh, main uh, uh, she, her main piece is uh, called uh, what is it? Alice in Wonderland. It's an opera. Uh, it was played in uh, in uh, Berlin, uh, London, and you know, many places. So we invited her, and uh, and she said the reason she composed that 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 that, that opera, Alice in Wonderland, is because um, she, read, she read this book called Unobtainted Alice in Wonderland when she was in the graduate school. And she actually understood the mathematical symbolism there. You know that it's actually it's full of mathematical symbolism. And she actually, someday she dreamed of uh, uh, composing an opera music based on that Unobtainted Alice in Wonderland. And she, she wonderfully did that. Uh, and, and so she introduced uh, the modern the trends in modern uh, com composition, music composition, from very, uh, and how com composers are experimenting with mathematical ideas. Like, there are some pieces that even use fractals, concepts of fractals, and, you know, she actually let the audience hear them and, and explain, and that sort of thing. So anyway, so again, 
it went very well. And those are the three four people. There was a moderator who is a well-known uh, pop, pop artist, who was a moderator, and then two hosts, and then the, the composer. So that was, we, so we did it uh, three times this year. This is an ICN year, so we, we decided to make a, go away from our routine. So, and, and focus on that only this time, instead of interacting with other branches of science. So this time we are actually getting, we are planning five lectures on mathematics only. Two, two events already took place, one by uh, essence of mathematics, number, function, structure, shape, and content, and three more to come in, in the fall. So next year we'll go back to our old routine and, and we are hoping, we are planning to uh, have an event on um, mathematics and biology. This time we will invite a, a renowned biologist and we will quiz her and, 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 and try to squeeze something out of her. So anyways, this is an interesting experiment and I hope it will evolve into, I don't know where it will evolve, it will, where it will lead us, but uh, I mean, maybe we'll, uh, you know, we'll, uh, uh, I don't know, we'll maybe get somewhere. And, uh, but so this is an ongoing and experimental project and I think so far it's, uh, it's been well received. As a winner. Would you like to know who is the winner? No. Well, you are the winners, and he's going to explain to you which is the prize. Please do not. Uh, ah, sorry, yeah, yeah. I, you see, I am not uh, used to stamps. Yeah. Uh, so, no, those who wish to stay here, of course, stay for the next, uh, to, to, to the next um, uh, discussion or lecture. But on the other hand, there is a guided tour to the imaginary exhibition. All our guides have usually this imaginary t-shirt. You find them out of the door. Those who wish to, to follow them, uh, they get a guided tour and explanation of the imaginary. And outside, also, there is some material. I'd like to mention, first of all, these snapshots, is very snapshots, which is very, very new, actually brings uh, hot topics in mathematics research, which are discussed in Europa to the general public through the imaginary platform. But you can take, take copies and learn something about uh, uh, primes and any other things on which are ongoing research. There's also some other material about imaginary, and there is an essay by myself on imaginary and mass communication of the future, those who wish to take a copy are invited to take so. Thank you very much.